All right, hello, everybody. Uh, I hope you're ready for something entirely different, more code splitting. Uh, and I know you're all are hungry, so I'll, I'll try to be quick. My name is Brandon Dale. I'm a software engineer at Formidable Labs. And we're a consultancy doing some really cool stuff with uh, React and open source. So if that sounds cool, come talk to me. But today, I mainly want to talk about code splitting, specifically smarter code splitting. And what I mean by that is, how can we use code splitting most efficiently in a way that provides the best user experience? And the last talk gave a really great overview of the basics of code splitting and how you can do it. So I don't think I have to echo many of those points. But there is one point I want to focus on, and that's using the right abstraction to define your split points. And I think my first point is code splitting shouldn't require new abstractions. So in the context of a React application, this means that your split points should be easily defined using components. And we saw that in the last talk with the async load. So the first library I want to introduce does exactly that, and that's called React Loadable. And some of you have probably heard of it. It's by James Kyle. And basically, React Loadable is a high order component that provides a really powerful interface for defining your split points within React. And I'm just going to run through a quick example to show you the API. Is that big enough? I hope so. So this is using an imaginary product page that we're going to wrap up. And here we import the loadable function, which is going to return a component. And we call it with a configuration object. And the two required options are first a loader function, which React Loadable will call when it needs to actually load that chunk, and a loading component, which will be displayed until that loader function is resolved. And then we just export that uh, loadable product page, and we can use it wherever we would have used product page initially. Uh, and React Loadable provides a number of really great uh, features and configuration options, like a configurable delay or server-side rendering support. But the one feature that I want to focus on is a static method that it defines on this component called preload. And what preload lets you do is start loading that chunk before it's actually needed. So this means that we can now uh, develop strategies for optimizing our code splitting to make it faster. Uh, and it's important to note that preload doesn't return a promise or anything, so you can't orchestrate UI behavior around it. It's just an optimization. But I do want to talk about two sets of strategies uh, that we can use to you know, most efficiently utilize preload. And the first set is what I'm going to refer to as passive preloading. And basically what I mean by that is that's preloading without user interaction. So something like triggering the preload method in the lifecycle of a related component. Uh, basically, we don't require the user to do anything to preload. We're rendering it, uh, we're preloading it based on some existing render state. And the advantage, and I should say that passive doesn't mean unconditional. So you can passively preload based on state or user data. Uh, but the, the key point is that you don't have to have the user do anything. Uh, the advantage here is that it doesn't require user interaction. Uh, so that means that we can be more confident that our component is actually preloaded, no matter what the user is going to do, as long as this component is rendered. Uh, and it's consistent on all devices, because uh, again, it doesn't require them to do anything. But it's potentially wasteful and untargeted, because again, we're kind of doing it all the time. It's harder to infer user intent based on application state. Uh, but here's a quick example of how you might do that. So this is using that same product page that I showed earlier. And here we have a product list component. And it renders an imaginary product link component that will, we assume, link to that product page. And then all we do is we import that loadable product page, which again is the wrapper around the product page. And when this product list component mounts, we call that preload option. So that means whenever a product list uh, is mounted, our product page will be preloaded. And this means that we're assuming that product list and product page have a strong enough correlation that it's reasonable to preload product page whenever product list is mounted. And this is really easy to do. Again, you just call preload. But the key strategy, or the key point to implementing this strategy effectively is that you should use analytics and user metrics to justify passive preloading. Again, you can guess and you can say, well, they're probably going to be using this component. But the better you can measure it, the more effective this strategy is. So the next kind of preloading strategy I want to talk about is active preloading. I don't know if these are good names, but they're what I, what I came up with. Uh, and active preloading is basically the opposite of passive preloading in that it, it's based on user interaction. So this means that we're inferring a user's intent based on what they're actually doing, which means that we're assuming that what they're doing now gives us an indication of what they're going to be doing later. Uh, and more concretely, this means that we're triggering pre preloads uh, based on UI events. So mouse moves, clicks, scrolls. And the advantage here is that it's more accurate and less wasteful. You know, it's much easier to infer intent from what they're doing uh, 
over the passive preloading strategy. So this means there's less guesswork involved, but UI events are device specific, right? You can only click on your desktop, you can only do touch events on the mobile. So that has to be considered when you're using this kind of strategy. And here's a quick example uh, that does exactly this. So this is using that fake product link component I talked about earlier that's it's not fake anymore. And uh, we're using React Router's link, and then we're gonna import that product page again. And then we assume this link goes to some page that mounts that product page. And then on mouse enter, when they actually hover over the link, we're gonna preload. So we're preloading this page based on an action, the mouse event, that we assume infers that they are going to be going to that page. So again, it's more directed. And the basic point here is use indirect actions to infer user intent and to justify your active preloading. And the last thing I wanna talk about is a small library that I wrote called React Perimeter. And it lets you basically define an invisible boundary around any component and respond when that boundary is breached, specifically with mouse components or uh, mouse events. So let me just show you how you could use this with React Loadable to make active preloading a lot easier. So this is the same example from last time, but this time we're gonna import uh, React Perimeter, which is just a component, and then we're gonna wrap that link in a perimeter. And we give it a padding of 75 pixels, so we say uh, if the mouse reaches 75 pixels within this element from any direction, we wanna go ahead, oh, and we wanna call a callback, which is the on breach prop. And in this case, it's gonna preload it. And we tell it to do it once, because once it's preloaded, we don't need to do it anymore, and then it will deregister the listeners once it's done, so no overhead there. So, final thoughts and recap. Uh, use preloading to optimize code splitting for your users. Justify passive preloading with analytic data. Use active preloading to infer user intent. Use both, it's, it's not a one or the other, it should be a combination. React Perimeter makes active preloading easier. And thank you for listening. <laughs>